We often talk about holding gold in times of economic or market distress or even times of high inflation where other assets become devalued. But owning the underlying asset has disadvantages. Since the lows back in December, gold bullion has risen by around a quarter, whereas owning gold producers, the shares of those companies, would have netted you substantially more. And we're talking now to Angelos Damascos from Sector Investment Managers, where he's fund manager of the Junior Gold Fund. Angelos, welcome. I say the Junior Gold Fund, that's what it's called, but of course you've got silver producers in there as well, haven't you? But before we get on to the fund itself, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's behind all this, what's behind the big move. As we'll see in a moment when we look at your fund, how much of a, of a, of a leap ahead it's taken because of what's been happening in the gold and silver markets. First of all, how do you appraise what is going on in the bullion markets at the moment? Well, Jeremy, as you know, we've been in a bear market for precious metals for over four years now, uh, which is when investors were to totally apathetic towards owning precious metals and have actually been selling out of EDFs. But since the turn of the year, there has been a, a remarkable change in sentiment, and people have been buying into bullion ETFs, uh, uh, switching apparently into safe havens such as gold and silver. And the reason uh, for that we uh, attribute to the volatility we saw in the equity markets in the beginning of the year and the risk aversion by many investors. Uh, but since then, the interesting thing is that uh, the markets have recovered their poise and they have almost trended back to the all-time highs, but yet the bullion prices have also remained fairly firm and fairly strong at the high level. So we haven't seen a sell-off in bullion uh, given the strength of the equity markets. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, we have always maintained that we believe the equity markets are, are overvalued and are set for a correction. We are now seeing again another little bit of a wobble. And if we see another corrective mood uh, heading into the summer, uh, we, this could give a, an extra impetus to uh, investors to buy more of uh, precious metals as a safe haven again and store of value. So it looks like the, there is a firm change in uh, sentiment. Okay, you've, you've brought on a couple of charts. If I can start by taking a look at ETF holdings. You mentioned ETF holdings. Let's take a look at ETF holdings of gold, first of all. And I think this illustrates well the point that you make. Uh, if we can bring up the chart on that, we show that there is this rise from the beginning of the year. And you can see it's, it's running up as a gentle move, but it's held on to those gains. So you, you, su you suspect that we're going to at least keep these levels? Yes, uh, we believe that people who buy into ETF uh, holdings of gold are not uh, very quick fire speculators who buy and sell for a slight rise uh, and a slight gain. They are people who genuinely believe there are problems, fundamental problems in the global economy and they should uh, increase their allocation to something that could protect the downside uh, in any eventuality. And this is what we see from the rise in ETF holdings. We have risen by more than 9 million ounces in the year to date uh, in gold holdings uh, and that indicates a, I indicates a very strong interest by financial investors mm. who are the people who buy ETFs. Mm. Um, it's interesting if we then go on to the silver ETFs we, we, we've got this rise but it's a very different sort of ride that we've had. Why is this? I mean from mid-February it's been well it was almost a straight line for yeah. a week. Well, silver has, has historically been obviously much more volatile than gold, uh, but it has also been used as a proxy for gold by uh, safe haven investors. And we believe this is what happened in the middle to end of February, that people realized that gold was rising very rapidly, and whereas silver had lagged behind for a few months. And, and, and uh, compared, uh, again, there is a very useful indicator called the gold to silver ratio in the market, um, and, and compare the value of silver against that of gold in, in terms of relative value and you can see from uh, the beginning of March how the ratio has changed has dropped dramatically from uh, about 82 83 units down to 72 73 uh, but you also have to bear in mind that the long term the 30 year average for the gold silver ratio is around 66 so, so it's well off the bottom of this chart it's well off the bottom of this chart and indicates that we could well have a f further catch up of uh, silver to gold okay so this is predominantly the rise in the price of silver over the relative rise in the price of gold so the the two are coming effectively closer together right. in, the, in the, the difference. Yeah. And you see this potentially as something which might continue. 
Yes, uh, because historically silver has been much more volatile. Uh, it has fallen much more than gold in the four years of bear market. Therefore, now with the change in sentiment, it could uh, proportionally rise significantly more than gold. But what the rise of these metals do is they increase the profitability of the gold and silver miners and therefore drive the re-rating of the shares of those companies that benefit from this profitability expansion. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's um, use that as a way to get into what's been happening with your fund, your, uh, the Junior Gold Fund. I think we've got a list of uh, the top, your top 10 uh, positions as at the 29th of April. There, there, are, there are some companies here of, um, of, of, of some substantial size. There are some smaller ones. Um, of, of this list here, I mean, I think they've all gained, haven't they, in the, in the period? That's, that's the they have all gained tremendously. The reason why you see several silver companies in our top 10 positions uh, it, it is because they have outperformed the gold, the gold miners uh, as the silver price has uh, re-rated. Uh, historically, our fund is weighed 20% silver, 80% gold mining. Uh, so the, the impact of the rise of the silver mining content of the portfolio has been significant, but it could have been remarkably more if it had been a silver fund, for example. Mm. Uh, but the, the point uh, here is that uh, there are certain companies that have uh, improved their balance sheet, they improved their cost effectiveness through the, the very tough two, three years uh, the, uh, of a bear market, and are now in the best position possible to expand this profitability uh, from a low base and with a very limited downside risk. Okay. Okay, let's, let's take a look at um, a, a couple of these uh, really big ones in your fund. First of all, First Majestic Silver, which right. I think is the, the biggest single weighting you've got of, of companies. Right. Yes. Now, this has seen a substantial rise year to date, like at almost 180% as of the 29th of April, right. with a market capitalization almost $2 uh, billion. Silver Company, I believe it's based with production in Mexico, is that right? Yes, it's a very simple model. It's probably the purest silver play you can buy in the market among the listed equities. Uh, it it uh, produces about 80% of its volume in pure silver, and it's exclusively focused in Mexico. It owns six operating mines, so it has a very diversified operating base, uh, and therefore um, we, we believe that it has a much more sustainable operating cost structure going forward. Uh, it expects to deliver between 12 and 13 and a half million ounces of silver in the year to date, with another uh, five to six million uh, of e silver equivalent production coming from the byproducts of uh, silver and of uh, lead and zinc. Uh, but uh, the, the, it's a very uh, big success story because over its 10 years of history, it has grown its production uh, by almost 10 times. So, and it has done this uh, b both organically and by acquisition. Uh, and it's a very, very competent management team. It focuses uh, on Mexico exclusively. It employs the best people uh, that are available in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we expect that, uh, for example, to give you an indication of its profitability, at $18 per ounce of silver, it expects to earn an EBITDA of $142 million per annum. So it's a very, very uh, profitable operation once silver prices rise. Uh, and, and that has to bear in mind that uh, their uh, lowest uh, operating cost, uh, the all in uh, sustainable cost, is in the region of $13 per ounce, so well below the current prices. Yeah, let's take a look at the um, share price of First Majestic Silver. This trades in Toronto, doesn't it? Uh, right. This is a Tor yes. Toronto listed company. Uh, and it's interesting, actually, talking there about the, the, the slight easing of the, the price of silver in the last few days, and this has been represented yep. by this daily chart here of First Majestic Silver. But um, the, the, the gain can quite clearly be seen. I want to move on, if I can, to take a look at your second pick. It's your second largest company. This is a gold right. stock, a gold yep. miner, isn't it? Yep. Endeavour uh, Mining, a uh, fund weight of 5.1%. Yeah, and that's a West African focused gold producer. Uh, it expects to deliver between 535 and 560,000 ounces of gold in 2016 from four mines uh, in West Africa in the, in the countries of Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, Ghana, and Burkina Faso. So it has a, a spread of uh, jurisdiction that reduces the perceived political risk of uh, West Africa if uh, uh, someone wa wanted to focus on the political risk. 
Uh, in addition to that, it has a, a new plant mine uh, in Burkina Faso that is expected to start production in the fourth quarter of uh, next year, and that would add another 235,000 ounces of production. So you can see Endeavour reaching to 900,000, possibly more, uh, per annum production in a couple of years' time. Um, and, and all of that has been in a period where it has again consolidated its balance sheet, it has reduced the indebtedness, it has reduced its operating costs significantly, expecting in 2006 between 860 and $900 per ounce. Um, it, it has uh, a, a, a lot of uh, fundamental growth of expected 57% within the next two years. Mm. So there, there is uh, still a lot of um, value to deliver to the shareholders, and yet it is trading at uh, 4.9 4 times price to cash flow, which is a significant discount to its peer group. Uh, uh, if, if you look at the, the peer group average, is well over seven. Yeah, okay, quick uh, look at the uh, share price chart. Just to uh, clarify what's going on here is a consolidation of uh, shares. But since uh, the beginning of December, uh, since we saw that low actually in the price of gold recently, uh, yeah. we've had that uh, tremendous rise up in uh, this price. Just to illustrate actually from that low point there, which is where we saw that beginning of that 25% rise in gold, this stock is up almost 200%. So, Endeavour Mining, your second uh, yeah. big stock. I want to go back to silver, if I can, for your third pick, Great Panther Silver. Right. I think this takes us back to Mexico, doesn't it? That's right. And Mexico is the biggest producer of silver in the world. It's, it's the natural jurisdiction to focus if you want to be a silver miner. Uh, and, and Great Panther is another very successful uh, silver producer that has followed a, a similar pattern to First Majestic, only in a smaller context. Uh, it, it runs uh, two producing mines in Mexico, for wh from which it expects to, to produce between 4 and 4.2 million ounces of uh, silver this year. And its operating costs are slightly higher than First Majestic, uh, between 13 and 15 dollars per ounce. But uh, at the same time, it has managed to maintain this production without debt at all. It has zero debt. Uh, and and uh, therefore, significant operational leverage to rising uh, silver prices. Mm. Um, again, a very low downside risk given the low leverage. It has a very large project coming uh, on in uh, Peru, uh, which uh, could add significant production. So it has all these elements of r uh, safe, uh, relatively safe value with low downside risk, yet very strong growth in, in production and, and uh, cash flow generation. Yeah. Quick snapshot of the share price chart, a uh, big rise up that we've seen. It's a bit of consolidation going on here. Yeah, you see, since, since the beginning of this month, in the last couple of days alone, we have seen a, a retracement of prices of between 10 and 15 percent. But that's coming off a very uh, big spike end of April. Mm. Uh, and we believe that a lot of the funds, uh, at least the generalist ha funds, have been caught underweight, silver and gold miners and have been rushing to build up uh, portfolio allocations, which has caused this spike in the end of April. Now people are taking stock, they are trying to see wh where is the next step. But uh, if you look at the fundamentals, uh, we believe that uh, gold and silver prices have, have a, a lot more to, to run. Uh, and uh, at least for gold, if we break uh, above the $1,300 uh, per ounce limit, uh, which is a fairly important psychological level, we could run to 1450 very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and, and that uh, rise would cause a, a further dramatic expansion in profitability of the miners and therefore further re rating. Okay, looks great to have you back in and to talk about some of your picks on your junior gold fund. Angelos, thanks indeed uh, there for joining us. That uh, is Angelos Damascos there from Sector Investment Managers with the Junior Gold Fund.